Now I would like to invite, now we're going to talk about prescription on, for resilience. That is going to be our next discussion and our next and final uh, panel. I would like to welcome the moderator, Ram Levy, who is the founder and CEO of Confidas, uh, a cybersecurity crisis management company. Um, Ram Levy is uh, on, on healthcare aspects. Confidas is preparing pharmaceuticals company in Israel, largest health organization for cyber crisis, including hospitals and community care services. Ram, you're welcome. The stage is all yours. Let us prepare the chair. Hi, everyone. That was a wonderful day. Um, so first, thank you for organizing this. And not, I don't know, how, that was a wonderful day and great content. I'm pretty sure that most people lied about what keeps them up at night because I think it's uh, making presentations. It's what keeps us at night, preparing for boards and understanding the situation. Um, before I go uh, into few words that I mentioned, I'd like to welcome our panelists. Uh, we changed the format, so it's more relaxed. So it's the end of the day. Um, so I'll call, the, I'll call the panelists, and then I'll say a few words, and we'll jump into the discussion. So uh, first, let me introduce um, uh, Professor Dr. Raymond Chua Sweef Boone. Did I say it correctly? Uh, from Singapore, he's a Deputy Director General of Health and Health Regulation and Assistant Commissioner for Cybersecurity Healthcare in the Ministry of Health of Singapore. Uh, and Esti Shelley, who is the Director, Je Director and Digital Health Division of the Ministry of Health. Uh, Professor Joram Weiss, who is the Director General of Hadassah Medical Organization. And last but not least, from the Netherlands, uh, Gal Gnainski, who is the VP, Chief Security Officer of Royal Philips. Is it Philips or Royal Philips? Royal Philips. Good. Royal Philips. Um, I'd like to say a few words from what we've seen uh, from uh, working with many hospitals and speaking to spending, I, I, th I think, about thousands of hours to medical staff in Israel. Um, I believe that hospitals, uh, they face not only uh, helping, helping patients in disease, uh, but they're also battling the unseen adversary, which are hackers. Uh, cyber attacks, they pose a distinct challenge to them. And compared to other crises in healthcare, in healthcare organizations, which traditionally they're ready for, I'm talking about uh, earthquakes, pandemia, IT failures, natural disasters, uh, cyber attacks are a little bit different. And the reason is, is because usually they would strike without early warning, uh, there are no visual signs. Um, the impacts are enduring. They're very long. Um, that's one of the few cases where the hospital is actually the victim, uh, and they don't have to support uh, the community who's been affected. The path to full recovery will, will usually take a uh, month. It will be very expensive. Uh, there's going to be a delay in response because we don't really understand what's going on. So. Um, there's a mis misrecognition of the situation. Uh, the knowledge required to deal with the attack is usually not within the organization. Uh, and, as, and as a result, what we see, um, that ambulances and patients are redirected to other hospitals. The access to medical records can be inhibited for weeks. Uh, there's going to be usually a loss of uh, medical records. Uh, confidential health records will be, will be leaked and exposed online. Uh, critical infrastructure for the hospitals, like labs, radiology equipment, is disrupted, which is, by the way, probably perhaps the most uh, important aspects. Non-critical appointments will be canceled. Now, who decides what's critical and what's not from the eyes of the patient? And if we look at global data, in 16% of attacks, 
Um, appoints, appointments and surgery will, will be canceled, and we're talking about 400 attacks per year. That's a lot of, that's a lot of um, surgeries and, and appointments that are canceled. And in 70% of the attacks, they result in exposure of data leakage, and now we're talking about just in the last two years of tens of millions of healthcare data that, that has been uh, leaked online. Now, what's interesting is that we usually look at uh, protecting, the, protecting the hospital itself, but a recent uh, research from JAMA Networks says something very interesting, and with that I'll finish. The study examined the regional healthcare disruption at hospitals that are adjacent to the hospital that has been attacked. And the finding is quite alarming because what they're saying is that they see a significant increase in patient census, ambulances arrivals, uh, waiting times, patients left without being seen, total patient length of stay is increased, countrywide emergency medical services diversion and acute strokes care metrics were seen in the unaffected uh, emergency department. Now that means that there is a ripple effect that we should worry about when we speak about securing, securing hospitals. And what they're saying in this, uh, what they're suggesting is that probably one of the key findings from, from this is that we should start treating cyber attacks not only as a cyber attack on the hospital itself, but something that we need to coordinate and plan as a as a, as, a, as a natural disaster that should be treated widely. Now joining us today are esteemed panelists, uh, and I'm pretty sure that we'll be hearing from them very interesting insights. And I'd like to start, um, I'd like to start with you, uh, Professor Shua, um, and ask you, as a Director of General Health of, and, and Assistant Commission for Cybersecurity in Singapore, uh, could you share with us your thoughts and insights into the regular requirements uh, necessary for handling cyber threats in Singapore, and how do you see and what's your perspective on that? Uh, so thank, thanks again for uh, inviting us. I note that we are the only non-Israeli <laughs> uh, uh, panelist member here, so I think I'm very um, glad and very honoured that Singapore is invited here to actually um, um, be able to share some of our insights and thoughts, as well as also then, you know, to discuss potential areas for collaboration. Like what you have mentioned, actually, I think this is not just an isolated incident that, or an isolated area in which we should be working by ourselves, but something that we should be working collaboratively together uh, with across different nations. I think one of the things uh, in Singapore is that uh, if we have read, actually five years ago in 2018, we have suffered one of our biggest cyber attacks in Singapore. Actually, one of our class uh, hospitals, uh, major hospitals, uh, was attacked by a hacker. At least 1.5 million patient made medical records have been hacked. That included our prime minister's record. You know, so I mean, even our VIP's records were not spared. And I think that was really a wake-up call for us in Singapore because I think um, we have been focusing quite a lot on cyber security for finance because we always thought that money was very important. Uh, we didn't know that actually healthcare records was also one of the prime targets for the hackers. I think then we have started to look at uh, enhancing our regulations uh, for cyber security itself. And I won't say it's just about cyber security but also healthcare data in general. So what we have put in over the past few years, uh, basically um, at the regulatory level, at the uh, service provider side, we have actually have laws to state that as licensed providers, you must make sure that you ensure that your records are being kept safely. I think um, we have also been living in a very old era of looking at records in the, digi uh, in the paper format. But now that we move into the digital for, uh, uh, format, how do we actually look at um, uh, uh, recognizing the safeguard of um, records in the digital format? And I just want to just share something quite uh, uh, funny, you know, because every time when we talk about digital records regulations to our licensees, they will tell us that they have never seen a fire or a theft to their paper records, but they have seen so many hackers you know, that they say, why do you want to move even in that area? Why don't you just keep it in the physical format that is even safer than digital? 
You know, so that's something that, you know, is a big challenge. So you ask me whether it's a challenge, I would say that that has been one of the biggest challenge, trying to convince our people to move from a paper record to a digital record. But then it says that within our regulations, we say they must keep it, you know, safely. They must have uh, uh, policies and processes to ensure that it's being safely uh, 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 collected as well as stored. I think on the other hand, we also say that they must have emergency planning exercises to ensure that they participate in uh, tabletop exercises to ensure that uh, a lot of their processes are robust in safekeeping their records. I think this is not just in our healthcare service regulations, but as part and parcel of our cyber security regulations for our public national in, uh, infrastructure, there is also uh, requirements to ensure that that is being done. But I think we find that that's going forward, that is going to be quite ins uh, insufficient controls. I think the next stage of what we are moving into is what we call the healthcare information bill. And that's something that we will be rolling out in the next one year. Uh, we are undergoing extensive consultations now because we know that going forward, a lot of we are going to digitalize our healthcare system in Singapore. So one of the things is that well, a lot of our systems will be connected to, into what we call a national electronic health record, which means that in future, every provider you go to, they can actually go into a national electronic health record to access you know, a summarized uh, record itself. So you will know that, let's say, you, today you see a GP, um, tomorrow you go and see another specialist or another GP, the, they, they will be able to know the previous day's consultation, what the records are, you know, what the diagnosis, what the medications were, what the investigation results are. That means that the surface attack, you know, is actually much right. bigger. You know, once you have everybody linked up into the National Electronic Health Records, and in addition to the medical records, I think we are also talking about, I think COVID has shown us that there's a lot of remote consultation going forward. So, you know, medical devices, how do you actually move a lot of patients from hospitals to homes? Home I think, you know, in, in Israel, you have a lot of hospital at home schemes. Once you have that, medical devices needs to then talk to our, uh, our clinic management system, send in the data. Again, that surface area increases. How do we look at uh, uh, safeguarding medical devices itself? And therefore, I think, you know, in our consultation, we are looking at how, what are the unified data and cyber security requirements that every licensee have to abide by. We are also proposing something, uh, what we call a, uh, a cyber security labeling scheme for medical devices. You know, because we are also saying that how do you actually get the medical device certified that is safe? You know, so this is something that we, I can elaborate later. But these are some of the thoughts in terms of the regulatory requirements that we are putting in. But when we look at the regulatory requirements, we usually try to ensure that we do not impede accessibility to care and quality of care. I think that's very important because most of the time, if the requirements are very strict, then I think accessibility is is uh, uh, impacted and we're trying to balance that itself, you know, between quality, between safety, as well as also accessibility. From the regular perspective, how do you make sure that the hospitals are actually doing what you expect them to do? Uh, so, after, so usually what we do is when it comes to regulations, there's a stepwise process, you know, in, in terms of we will usually work with them on proposing some of the regulatory requirements then we will engage them to understand whether they can or cannot meet. And then after that, we will do training. And then after that, we will do uh, uh, random audit and compliance checks to make sure that they actually will meet some of the regulatory requirements. And if they don't meet, then what we will do is we can actually work with them to coach them, you know, uh, to try to meet it. Like, for example, you know, coming out with additional training programs, you know, uh, to guide them, etc. You know, but if they still don't meet, then of course there will be additional penalties that will come in place. Um, thank you. Esti, moving forward, you, you have a very unique perspective because um, you are responsible uh, for driving Israel's um, digital transformation and, and leading the policy and implementation the change of going to the cloud in the Ministry of Health. So you have a very, I would say, panoramic view of, uh, of what's going on in the healthcare system in Israel. And with such complex, ex complex ecosystem, I'd appreciate your thoughts on, on three things. One is, what are the steps take that we need to, that Israel needs to take in order to move the healthcare providers into the cloud? 
The second thing is, uh, what assessment tools do you provide them in order to do that safely um, and according to the requirements of the Ministry of Health? And third, how do you balance between their need to embrace new technology so they can provide better health care? Uh, and on the other hand, that they would ensure to, what do you do to ensure the resilience because they're using a lot of uh, vendors and providers? Thank you. Um, first, I would suggest that if you would like to see, like, fast forward a few years of some of the uh, topics and the regulation and the policies that you mentioned, uh, you can come and visit each uh, of the Israeli hospitals where um, we are not able today to go back to paper and pen. And I, and I think we need to recognize that, that fact because we always talk about, the, of course, the risks and the, and the challenges to work with all the cybersecurity uh, risk and hackers, etc. But one, um, one aspect that we are trying always to bring to the table is to think about the benefits of connecting, of interoperability, of the ability to uh, to go to the hospital after you visit your GP and to be able to see the results of the uh, exams, etc. And I think we are at a point where, of course, we need to make sure that we, uh, we have a safe uh, healthcare system, but also the, um, the other side of being totally safe is not bringing or not being able to um, uh, to provide good care, and I think that's something that we always need to remember to balance. And this is one of the aspects that we try to balance in the cloud uh, policy. This is a process that we have done uh, started two years ago, that actually trying to put in place not just um, the risk management scheme for health organization to be able to to work with uh, different uh, systems on cloud but also bringing into the table the fact that for every system or every application that we are trying to consider to put on cloud, first let's put a question mark whether on-prem is safer than on cloud. I, I, I mean, taking into consideration um, the quality, how old are the systems in the healthcare system, I would put a question mark on that. And the second part is always think about the alternative, because the alternative of not doing something is, is a decision. It's a decision that you are taking of not giving access to patient to specific uh, technology, not giving access to physicians to a specific technology, and that means that they will be able to treat less people at the same time, and when we have shortage of uh, healthcare uh, providers, that's a risk that we need to understand, so I think one of the things that we try to bring to the table, besides of um, helping the healthcare organizations of understanding the risk and the mitigations and assess the risk on their own, not needing the uh, approval of the ministry for every step in the way. But the other part is to bring the, we call them the innovation people, but not just the innovation people, but the clinicians talking about the benefits of why we are asking to bring um, genetic consulting app to a hospital. What are, why we are doing it? Why we should try to find a way to mitigate the risk of working with genetic information on cloud? Um, and that's, I think, something that we always need to keep in mind because, and also, also the, the cost benefit of uh, cyber protection of course, there is always, we will need more and more and more uh, safeguards. And there is a cost for that, and there is a cost for a uh, cyber attack. And we always need to find a way to balance those two. And we are not in a scene or in an ecosystem where we have endless resources. So when we are asking more and more uh, requests in uh, cyber protection, that means that Professor Weiss, for example, is not able to do something else. And we need always to keep it in mind. I think that's very interesting. Um, it doesn't happen a lot that uh, a director general of a hospital has a, his hobby is cybersecurity, uh, but that's your hobby. And I'd like to ask you, um, uh, we've heard a lot, of, um, um, a lot about the risks of hospitals, but I'm asking myself, are we preparing for the attacks that have already happened, or should we prepare for what's going to happen? And the second thing is, 
from, from your perspective, how should hospitals integrate cyber crisis readiness uh, into their uh, operational day-to-day -day life? What do we tell the medical staff? What do we tell the nurses? What do we tell the people of the hospitals, the hospital, and how they should better prepare for the day that something might happen? So I'll start with the first question, which is, will we see the same of the same, or is it could be different? And the answer is always, when you think of cyber, you need to understand that what will happen the next time is something you didn't expect. So what you should do is all the time think, what is the next step that people may take in order to attack? Now, I'm head of an NGO, a non-for-profit organization, and I fully understand the issue of cyber from a simple issue, and you mentioned it before, and this is the privacy of patients. But we're focusing a lot, and I should say it has changed a lot over the past 10 years, but we focus a lot on the data, on the medical management systems. But we need to remember that we have also the infrastructure. And cyber attacks won't be just on what we're using today, and this is attacks on the information of the patient, which is very, very concerning. But we need to understand also that there are operation systems. And I heard this morning people have addressed that, and I fully agree with them. The issues are, for example, if you attack a hospital and you step air conditioning functioning, I can tell you as an anesthesiologist that within a few hours you stop functioning of the operating rooms and the ICUs. If you attack the computer systems and you create havoc with the computer systems, you won't be able to give radiation to your patients. You won't be able to manage your patients in the ICUs. So there are many, many implications on operation systems that may come in place. The other thing is, which people have mentioned, and I fully agree with them, is the issue of AI. And I would say the following. AI, when it comes to cybersecurity, is on one hand a blessing, but it's also a curse in disguise. And we need to understand it. And I can tell you, I created a form in my hospital which is supposed to provide me with an analysis of the risks of the current chat GPT that has been published and who and how it can affect our treatment of patients because our physicians with their palm hands can use it or with their desktop can use it. And what are the implications, the exposure that this may cause to our patients not talking about the ability of using AI systems in order to penetrate much faster into our computer systems. And finally, having talked about operation systems and the privacy of patients, the last thing which I would say is that we need to remember that the future will be also associated with the Internet of Things. In our hospital, we started working and treating patients outside of our hospital. The exposure is huge. So to conclude, and this is my last remark, going back to devices that connect outside of the hospital. And this may be either uh, comp companies that provide AI services to us, either comp, for example, in imaging, which is becoming very, very open. Secondly, using Internet of Things. And this is how do you connect safely to the hospital environment? We did analysis. It takes us about six months with a team of five people in many of these companies to evaluate them in order to be sure that there's a safe connection between the hospital and the company provider. And this is because of these many of these companies are focused on pro providing the solution. What they do not focus on is the safety of how they connect to the hospital. And what we're doing now is actually producing a platform in our institution, which I think we will put all these small companies, not the large institutions like Philips or Medtronic that presented here, but the smaller companies, they will have to meet a standard standard we have developed for this connectivity. Because I'm concerned, for me, sorry to say, Shelley, but to send data to, the, uh, to, uh, to a cloud, I think it's also a risk for hospital, and we need to try to address it. So these are very clearly the comments I would have. The other thing is what you mentioned is the preparedness of the teams. I would say the following. First of all, preparedness of teams is extremely important. Secondly, there's not enough preparedness. People tend to forget about cybersecurity. And it's our job as directors and managers to continuously hammer the issue of cybersecurity. However, we need also to understand that there's another group that needs to be aware of it, and we don't do enough, in my opinion, on that, and this is the patients. Because the more we provide information to our patients, 
the more our patients can deal with ones that bring up a flag telling us that there's a problem. Because my concern is dormant attacks that will penetrate the computer systems will slowly create changes in the information in the system, and you don't notice that. So you need also your patients and customers to be aware of that. So awareness of the teams, hammering on that, customers, and obviously having a very, very organized way on how to manage the hospital if there's currently an attack, and we maybe address it later. I cannot resist the temptation, but I have a very short, answer, short question to ask you. Um, the magic word in hospitals is accreditation. Do you think that we should include cyber preparedness as part of the accreditation process, rather than a standalone regulation that every ministry invents for itself? And First of all, I would say the following. Um, in general, the answer is yes. I would put accreditation, I would put cyber safety and safety regulation into accreditation. But let's put it on the table. There are many accreditation protocols in companies over the world. Israel has chosen JCI, which we are also joining, but there are others. There's the Canadian JCI, there's others, European ones. I think in, in general, it is the responsibility of the state through a mechanism, and this is really important for me to say, it's the responsibility of the states to demand hospital to meet a certain level of guidance and of regulation, and it is the responsibility of the state, and the state needs to understand that it's their responsibility also to provide the support to the hospitals to meet cybersecurity guidelines. Because I, I, I didn't want to go into that, but you raised the question. For us, we're investing a lot of money into uh, cybersecurity, and this comes out of taking it from other, as you mentioned, Shelley, from other services to patients that we need to provide. And we're an NGO, non-for-profit organization. And I think really that in cybersecurity, it's the responsibility of the state. Because at the end of the day, cyber attacks are moving from criminals more and more states. to states. Thank you. Absolutely. Okay, Mr. Gnaiski, um, let's talk about the role of the vendors. Uh, everybody's blaming the vendors for placing in uh, medical devices that hospitals cannot secure, and then you're saying that it should be the responsibility of the hospitals. Um, let's first define the roles and responsibility between the medical equipment suppliers and the hospitals. And last, I would like to know uh, what's the role of the regulators in all that, because somebody has to say what should be done and what can be done, and where do we meet the, I would say, the balance points between those two? Yes, thanks, great question. I think the beauty of this panel that we represent probably a big part of the ecosystem. So we have the regulators, we have us as providers or, or medical equipment manufacturers and, and what we call the customers, the hospitals. Um, and while we, we can have very crisp and clear regulations written out and put on the cloud, and we can have perfectly secure devices manufactured. So actually, I think all companies today produce very secure devices. Metronics just presented before us, and all the companies I know, we were able to produce very secure devices. It's all being channeled at the end to the hospitals. That's why I'm so happy to hear and to see two distinguished professors here, Professor Gamzo in the morning, Professor, Professor Weiss today, passionate about security. I think it starts and ends with senior managers of hospitals being passionate about security. Absolutely. So, and as well, of course, all of us has a, a role in the ecosystem. I don't think today there is a problem in the industry that manufacturers or suppliers do not provide security, secure devices. The scrutiny and the process that we have to go through to in order to submit or to license a device is so enormous that it cannot be not secure today. Of course, we have the legacy issue we can talk about, but today, if we take the cutoff of today, we are a secure environment. The regulators are very clear and they have a very specific guidance that should cover all aspects. And again, Professor Weiss, and Professor Gamzo in the morning spoke about it as well. It comes down, in my view, to funding and ability. So I'll give you an example. Philips is a commercial company. 
We are not non-for-profit. We invest in security. I have a team. I have resources. I have a budget. Why should my budget be bigger than Professor Weiss's budget in his ecosystem? He has a big organization. I have a big organization. It should be equally balanced. But it's not the case today for most and especially public hospitals. So we see, <clears throat> I, we work, of course, with in all countries, with all hospitals, we see different differences in maturity between hospitals. Hospitals that set up CISO organization and, and mature IT, you see, of course, better results. So I think, um, yes, we all have a role, we all have responsibility. Most of the challenge touches the legacy issue because 20 years ago when we sold equipment or services to hospitals, we didn't have, even have security clauses. So I can understand why hospital come to us and say, hey, it's your responsibility, but back then there were less responsibilities. Today, the contractual terms are very clear and, and can last us for the next 15 years. We learned from the uh, life cycle challenges of a device being lasting much longer than what we expected 20 years ago. I'd like to take you, I'd like yes. to challenge you a little bit. Sure. Uh, let's say a, a hospital bought uh, a medical device from Philips, and they bought it 10 years ago without yeah. the security that, they, that you have today, which, yes. which I'm sure is perfect. Um, can they do something by themselves without you? Uh, and if no, um, can you explain yes. why and what they can yes, do? Yes, they can. They can accept the responsibility. Okay, that's one thing. And of course, it all depends on the contractual agreement, but in most cases, there is no agreement that pushes the manufacturer to replace the device because it's obsolete. The hospital bought them 10 or 15 or 20 years ago with the different terms and conditions that today we face, with different risks. What we did at Philips, we just, uh, we have a cyber safe program, it's called, we approached all our clients with offering options. You can upgrade, in some cases you need to replace, but it, uh, it costs money and it's, not clear who should pay for it because back then we didn't have the operating system expiration to issues 20 years ago in hospitals clearly wants to use an MRI that is 15 years old we come and say we cannot service anymore because Microsoft doesn't support it anymore mm. so or we don't service it but they we need to service it if we cannot service it, it they cannot operate it so there is a lacuna or lacuna, I don't know if it's in, a, in English word, it's in Hebrew word. Shortage. Shortage and, or, or, or a black hole in the ecosystem and hospitals cannot afford to replace a well-functioning device, but it cannot be supported. So here, I think the state, and we see actually sign in, in the US over there, the Senate is talking about putting their hand into the pocket and help hospitals to replace obsolete devices. Manufacturers would not be able to do it, in my view. And hospitals will not be able to do it, in my view, by themselves. We have uh, three minutes, right, Tanat? So I'd like to open the floor for questions. I'm sure that, many, uh, that some of you might have uh, questions for the panelists. No one? For G GDPR. GDPR. I mean, who's the question for? It was for everyone. But just a second, we have a question from here, and then. What is your uh, thought about the incident of uh, immunization access question? In medical devices or hospitals? No. I, I think that this, these are regulations that, in a way, we must meet. Although we're not, uh, we're not, we're an Israeli organization, but because we're living today in a global world, so companies basically have to meet these regulations. And although I don't know if the Israeli government will require that, but I think many of the companies will have to re uh, meet these regulations, especially also because today you have cross-border uh, issues when it comes to legal issues, that if a patient is either American or European, by the way, and I don't know if you're aware of that, but you have to apply if it's Europe. For example, if I'm European and I'm European, so if I'm being treated here in Israel, basically the European regulations apply to me. So there's an exposure to the hospital. So as a hospital, I'm talking now of my organization, 
is we took the decision that we're looking at these guidelines and we're learning them and we're applying them. So this is my response. They're actually very good and uh, the Israeli privacy laws are about to change and adjust to most of them. So the regulation is quite good. No, and we, we follow, it's very strict. <laughs> you know, uh, all our devices needs to meet the capabilities of GDPR. And, and you know, you touch the point of data transfer. Yes, you know, we have China now developing the data transfer role. You have to keep stuff there, the EU and the US. We see a bit fragmentation and we need to manage data locally more and more. But our devices are fully supporting all GDPR uh, uh, capabilities, definitely. Absolutely. You had a question? Quantum. Anybody wants to dive into this question? Okay, there's another session in the in the quantum space over there. I, I think it's a good question, but uh, I, I, we we but deal with yeah. such a legacy issue in, in in the healthcare that quantum is futuristic. In medical devices, we look into that, of course, but I think we need to solve first the basic uh, issue of, of risks. And, and it, it's a challenge, you're right. Yes, please. We do both, we do both. Now, we don't call it OT anymore. All our products are connected. It's, you know, it's not really OT anymore. Yeah, some ultrasound move from place to place. You can see it as an OT, but we don't look at it as an OT. It's every d d device is be able to be able to connect remotely and service. And uh, and you know, we the, the hospitals, of course, we rely on their network and their their uh, their ability to uh, to manage their stuff. That's what that's what I thought. I said they need to invest more. Professor Weiss needs to be able to educate these people. I cannot educate them. The regulator cannot educate them. How? In, it, it needs investment. So, uh, Usually in cybersecurity, that's maybe a, a question for everyone. Uh, we like mechanisms of sharing information, but, ma but mainly sharing technical information. Uh, do you think that there should be a mechanism for sharing operational information between the hospitals? For example, how does one hospital recover from a cyber attack and what can other hospitals can do it? And if so, What's the mechanism that uh, we should implement and how should we do it? So, so maybe I start first. I think, you know, um, from our end, um, when something happens uh, to a hospital or a clinic, what we'll do is, uh, from a regulator end, when we detect this, we will then share some of the best, some of the issues, what are the rectifications across the different service providers. Then, of course, I think it will be very important to then share, a, you know, the best practices what are being done you know, by the actual providers across with the other providers. I think where we probably would need probably more international uh, collaboration is to start sharing some of this at the national level. That's true. You know, um, like what provides say, you know, is actually a state's you know, a readiness, a state's responsibility. So how do we actually m come together to do some of this sharing? I think there's a lot of intelligence actually being shared across what are the different vulnerabilities, what are the different threats, you know, what are the common issues that are being faced, or when some security issues, I think they are already at the cyber security level. But I don't know how much that is being promulgated down, you know, um, beyond just sharing the threat, but looking at how do we look at incident uh, response and some of the uh, measures that has been taken. I think when we look at regulations, we are really looking at these, th these three levels. One is actually at the hospital or service provider level. What are they doing? What are the, some of the things that they should be doing, let's say, to protect the environment itself? Like, for example, you know, do you look at access controls? Do you look at malware? Where are the issues that have come across? Then I think the next one is you know, the device or the product level. Is it a system problem? Is it a device problem? You know, and, 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 and when we were talking about medical devices, we actually do know that you know, uh, not just at the manufacturer's end, but even down to the procurement, you know, how the clinicians use it is very important. Yeah. Because like what we know, you know, when, when a pro clinician wants to procure a medical device, they will say, please go and procure. And then the procurement will just procure it without any due 
considerations to cybersecurity. Clinicians will also use it without due consideration to cybersecurity. How do you actually change some of these mindsets and you know and ensure you know that they are being trained properly? I think the third level is then back to the down the consumers. I think uh, that we have mentioned just That's now. True. Actually, a lot of data then resides at the consumers. How do they actually, when they're at home, connect to the correct network, ensure that their network is being secure, etc. To ensure that the in information that they actually uh, um, transmit across is being done in a safe and secure manner. I think all this, you know, we all have to then see how to do it uh, comprehensively itself. I think it's worth mentioning that a couple of years ago, the Irish health system was impacted by a ransomware, the entire health system. And what they did, I mean, usually health system or most companies, they would go inside, they would not say anything. Correct. They published a 180 uh, page report detailing almost everything that happened to them and all the recommendations that they could provide to other healthcare systems from this type, which is quite unique. So it's interesting. But I think sometimes sharing, you know, is better done face-to-face -face or through a virtual session. Reading through a report is usually very official. It's true. You know, when you talk and then you go into the depth of it, then you probably know what are the intricacies of handling the incident, which often does not come out through a report. Absolutely. Professor Weiss, you wanted to... Um, well, I, I should say that I think I want to give a compliment to the government of Israel, which is not typical. <laughs> I would like to say that the government of Israel, at least from our experience, and we had a few issue, incidents here in Israel continuously of the famous one where Hillel Yaffe was hurt, and, but they have also continuously we have attacks. And I want to say that the Israeli uh, Cyber Authority, together with the uh, Cyber Department and the Ministry of Health, are very good at sharing the information and talking to us on a regular basis. So I think in this regard, I would like to give credit. On the other hand, I would like to say that I think that the biggest problem, both in Israel maybe and abroad, is underreporting. And the problem with underreporting is, like with negative studies in science, is that when you underreport, basically, you take away information that we can learn from, and this is the critical issue. The critical issue is to teach people that when there is a problem and you identify the problem, as you mentioned, and I fully agree with you, share it as quickly as possible with everybody else because this will really enhance our readiness and this is critical. Thank you. Uh, Anat says that we're out of time. Um, so uh, first I'd like to Although thank you so much. No well, you want to do a survey? Maybe we can continue now. <laughs> I'd like to thank you so much for coming here today and sharing your valuable thoughts with us. And just before we leave, yes, the threats are evolving. Yes. Uh, the threats are evolving, but so, uh, so as our defense mechanisms and our knowledge, so we can do much better. Thank you, everyone. Just a few last words. Um, thank you, everyone, for coming to this uh, event. Thank you for all the speakers and the um, participants here. We learned a lot of things. Also, as we heard at the beginning, in the national level, we're doing a lot of things, like the Cyberdome. And we do, co we do have collaboration with the Ministry of Health, and we do have a strategic uh, program we're working on. We do believe in sharing information. Um, we call it in Hebrew, beyachadness, togetherness. Um, and if you think you can contribute in any way and you want to join or collaborate, feel free to, join, to, to contact us. Um, and that's about it. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a great day.